say words like ain't and y'all and howdy, and that's just the way I talk. And I've listened to myself on the, on the internet with the bad move. Do not listen to yourself talk. <laughs> They are. Thus, the reason I was able to hear how desperately, uh, <laughs> desperately sad I sound on the radio or the internet. But we're going to try this anyway. Um, we're going to try to um, get through this particular subject. Um, I'm going to read one verse of scripture to begin with, and this was not in my notes. This was something that the Lord impressed on me just now. Um, the Bible says in Romans chapter 1 verse 22 that professing themselves to be wise they became fools and changed the glory of the uncorruptible God into an image made like into corruptible man into birds into four-footed beasts and creeping things. Wherefore God also gave them up to uncleanness through the lust of their own heart to dishonor their own bodies between themselves, who changed the truth of God into a lie, and worshipped and served the creature more than the Creator, who is blessed forever. Amen. This evening, I'm going to talk about dinosaurs, but that is not the focus of this. The focus is not the creature. The focus is the Creator. When we get wrapped up in the sensationalization of topics, people get wrapped up in the revelation because of the uh, apocalypse and all the prophecy. They're not interested in Christ coming back. They're, they're, they've got this morbid interest in the destruction that comes. People seem to they get excited about things like the creation story and studies. Not because God created, but because of some kind of uh, quest for some kind of hidden knowledge that maybe somebody else doesn't have. That's not what we're after here. Everything that the, that the Bible talks about, some of it is sensational, some of it is simply amazing, but it all points back to God, the Creator. And in that, He has created these great and wonderful things, but there's nothing greater, nothing more amazing than His love for mankind. And the fact that He was willing to save us from our sins. So yeah, did He create dinosaurs? We're going to talk about that. Is He coming back? Yeah, He's, he's coming back. But more important than dinosaurs is salvation. Let's pray right quick. Heavenly Father God, we thank You for this opportunity to be in Your house. And we thank You for Your love. And we thank You so much for Your Word by which we can understand and know You. We can know Your plan. We can know where we've come from and where we're going. God, we don't have to be ignorant. We do not have to be uh, led astray. We can, we can keep ourselves from being deceived if we stay in Your Word. I pray, Holy Ghost, that You will guide and direct each thing that's spoken today. I pray, Lord, that You'll open our hearts and our minds to understand Your Word. I pray that You'll make things clear to us, God, that it will bring You glory and it edify Your believers. In Jesus' name we pray this evening. Amen. All right. We're going to start on dinosaurs. What does that have to do with our topic? Absolutely nothing. I just thought it was a cool picture. That is so awesome. Not a thing. It's just really cool. It's just a cool picture. I found that and I thought, man, I got to have that. I got to have that. That's just awesome. Do what? Yeah. Yeah, there you go. There you go. I wonder how you, I wonder who was the first person who saddled one of them rascals, huh? All right. <laughs> All right. Why do some why do Christian people have a problem with dinosaurs? Okay. Dinosaurs 
are really enigmatic, controversial subject in Scripture. And the main reason is because when the evolutionists began to hammer down their, um, their idea, their practice, their uh, theory, they, they needed to find something that would resonate with people. They had to find something of a mascot. Clemson's got the, and Carolina's got the, and when you see a tiger around here, you automatically think Clemson. That's their mascot, right? You can't go. Now in India, you see a tiger, you think dead people. But in, a, in, in this area, you see a tiger, you think Clemson. You think football. Because the mascot has been drilled into us and it resounds within us. The evolutionists were amazingly good at marketing. They knew that if they got something, got a hold of something that people were kind of drawn to, that people were attracted to, that it would be a great mascot. And one thing that they picked was dinosaurs. Why? First of all, dinosaurs are just by nature cool. People like dinosaurs, even if they don't think they like dinosaurs, there's something about it that just makes us want to know something about them. It's because you can't go down to the zoo and see one. And so there's something, something mysterious, something foreign about something that you can't see and become familiar with. You cannot pick up a book. My son brought me a couple of books. I meant to bring them. Sorry, buddy. A couple of books he had. He's 10 years old. A couple of books. Both of the books that he had on dinosaurs started out 65 million years ago. During the Jurassic and Crustaceous periods, every book, including a, a book written by Dr. Seuss, starts out with the words millions of years ago. When you get a, a mascot like a dinosaur that children love to read about, and you take that opportunity to inject in every book millions of years ago, millions of years ago, millions of years ago, what subconsciously happens around that dinosaur and what happens around a worldview. It immediately stretches time periods into millions of years. During which time, see, the evolutionist doesn't have to sell you on macro evolution. They don't have to sell you on chemical, on biological evolution, on stellar evolution, on on cosmic evolution. They just have to sell you on millions of years and then something has got to fill up that time. It's very easy once, you're, once you've bought the idea of millions of years, then you can buy any of the rest of it. Right? Just like a good commercial, get you hungry and they can sell you a hamburger. Okay, so why do Christian people have a problem with dinosaurs? Most have been so indoctrinated with evolution that we doubt what the Bible teaches. Most Christians are afraid to even come close to supporting the biblical account because they believe that science has proven dinosaurs are millions of years old. That is the reason most people shy away from teaching on dinosaurs or any of the early books of Genesis. Owen, bring me what you got. Thank you. This is only a piece of one because that's all we could afford. This is a tooth. One single tooth from what was called a megalodon shark. Now this shark had a whole mouthful of these suckers. Owen, do you have a problem with anybody looking at this? Okay. One thing you'll notice, first of all, that you'll notice there's only half of it. Second thing you'll notice is this is a fossil. The actual uh, live part of the tooth that was there has been replaced with minerals, resulting in this black color. 
This is actually a rock. Okay? And the third thing that you'll notice is that there, if you look at this, there is not a date on this rock. When they found this rock, somebody got that sucker and said, wow, what a big tooth. And then they determined, well, we've got to figure out when this thing came from. So they date it based on the rock layer in which they found it. Under the assumption that a centimeter rock layer may have been laid down over thousands of years. Therefore, every rock layer may represent hundreds to thousands to millions of years of sediment deposit. They dated this by a layer in the dirt in which they picked this up from. How did they determine the layer of the dirt? Because they found this bone in it. And therefore, you've got a, about a, I believe I looked it up, they said that this probably was about 25 million years ago. How do they know? They weren't there. It doesn't say, hi, I'm a 25 million year old, old shark bone. It simply is a tooth. Our, when we come to any of these ideas, we come to them with a preconceived notion of where things come from. We don't live in a bubble. We don't live in a vacuum. We live with our ideas and with everything that has been taught to us, um, prejudices. And so a creationist will see this and say, wow, God made a big shark. And an evolutionist will see this and say, wow, this is a big shark that evolved by chance and random mutations over millions of years. What's the difference? It's the same too. The difference is the mindset. People say, what about carbon dating? Carbon dating can give you any answer you want because the half-life half -life of carbon-14 is so small that it can't go past several thousand years, period. Radiometric dating, all kinds of different uh, dating methods that have been proven time and time again to give erroneous outcomes. Why? Because you don't know what you're starting with. You don't know what the starting point was. People say, well, we, got to know, we have these dating methods. Really? You walk into a room and you see a candle burning on the table. How tall was that candle? Hmm? Do you know? You don't know when it was lit. You don't know how long it's been burning. You can tell the wax there, but you don't know if somebody started it burning and then stopped and started it and stopped it and started it. You have no idea. All you know is a candle was burning on the table. We have no way to go back to anything and determine this is how old something is because we don't know where we started it from. Our ideas are simply based on exactly that, theories. Christians have at least as good of an answer, and that is God created. If anybody wants to see, anybody want to see the big church too? Yes. Okay. How do you know it's a tooth? I mean, do they test this or something? I mean, well, if we're going to be skeptics, let's be real skeptics. Okay. <laughs> Anybody want to see the rock? <laughs> Here you go. Um, well, honestly, there are certain characteristics that um, they will be able to identify based on shape, based on position. They may have found that in a jawbone. I mean, we've actually found, they have found intact skeletons. Okay, entire skeletons. They actually have uh, the jaw, the preserved jaws of some of these immense creatures. No, we, they just had a box of these things, and that thing, I think that thing right there was near 30 bucks. Was it 10? Huh? Oh, that was 10 because it was broken in half. If you'd have got the full one, it would have been a little more expensive. Yeah. All right. So, we're so indoctrinated with evolution that we doubt the Bible. We're afraid 
that conceding the existence of dinosaurs means that we have compromised with evolutionary teachings. Our starting point... It worked. No? Do you know that this, those sounds were created in the sound stage? By mixing, a, by mixing several different sounds together. Um, you know, honestly, they don't even know all that this is how he was shaped. We don't know. It's interesting, but we... We, it has only been within the past few decades that they've actually found fossilized dinosaur skin. But fossilized skin is not, that, that tooth was not black. It was a white tooth. The minerals that impregnated it per, uh, penetrated into the porous cavities and re-solidified were black. Therefore, what was the tooth is gone. All we've got is basically a cast made out of minerals, basically like filling a, a mold with cement. You follow me? So, we have no idea what the colors would actually have been. Alright, let's look at this. Why do Christians have a problem? Mainly it's because of our starting point. This is uh, Darwin's origin of the species and the Holy Bible. Everything matters on your point of reference. Your starting point. If you start with the Bible and you bring all the evidence to the Bible, you're going to come to one conclusion, aren't you? And if you start with an idea like uh, the theory of evolution and Darwin's teachings, then if you start with it and bring all the evidence to it, you're going to come to a different conclusion. Scientists claim objectivity, but they are not objective. It is a lie. It is a fallacy. It is a complete falsehood that a scientist is completely objective. They have preconceived notions. They have a starting point. Do not be deceived by this world. All right. Genesis chapter 1, verse 20 through 25. Let's start here. And God said, Let the waters bring forth abundantly the moving creature that hath life, and fowl that may fly above the earth in the open firmament of heaven. And God created great whales, and every living creature that moveth which the waters brought forth abundantly after their kind, and every winged fowl after his kind. And God saw that it was good, and God blessed them, saying, Be fruitful, and multiply, and fill the waters in, in the seas, and let the fowl multiply in the earth, and the evening and the morning were the fifth day. And God said, Let the earth bring forth the living creature after his kind, cattle and creeping thing, and beasts and the, and beast of the earth after his kind, and it was so. And God made the beast of the earth after his kind, and cattle after their kind, and everything that creepeth upon the earth after his kind, and God saw it was good. Now, we've got two days here. The last, which... I did not add was the creation of man on the sixth day. The fifth and sixth day were the days where life were, was created. Not three billion years ago. Lightning didn't strike the primordial soup. Instituting the movement from the goo through the zoo to you. But on the fifth day of creation, God created life. And what we will see here is the Bible says after their kind. One thing I th find it interesting is how people will like to create a straw man argument that says how in the world is it possible for all these different species and all these different breeds to come from just a couple of animals. I have no problem with recognizing that all dog varieties came from a single pair of dogs. Anybody who studies genetics will find out that species and variation is a subtraction or movement of information. It is not an addition of information. 
And genetics will actually create the different varieties of dogs. Cattle. Cattle are done the same way. Anybody ever seen a Brangus? One of the meanest bulls I ever seen was a Brangus. It was a mixture of an Angus bull and a Brahma. Anybody ever seen a Brahma? Everybody, anybody ever watch bull riding? Yep. Love bull riding. Love to watch it. Never would strap myself on one of them suckers. But it was a big black bull with a huge hump on its back. How'd they get that? They bred a Brahma and an Angus, and they got a Brangus. Anybody ever seen a beefalo? It's a mixture of a cow and a buffalo. Have anybody ever seen a liger? A liger is the combination of a lion and a tiger. These are simply variations and breeding and crossbreeding, but they're within their kind. In other words, a lion and a tiger may not be the same species. They may not be the same variety, but they're the same kind. They're both felines. Around here, y'all might understand this one. How about a mule? A mule is the breeding of a horse and a donkey. Right? They're not the same variety. They're not the same species, but they're the same kind, equine. Now, I want to look at this word right here. And God created great whales. We do recognize that God did not talk in thou's and these, and thou shalt, and hitherto fours, and wheresoever. The Bible was actually written, the Old Testament was written in Hebrew. Right? I don't speak Hebrew. Not a lick of it. Not, not, no, there's some people who say I don't even speak English, so we're not going to get into Hebrew, but what I will say is that we had to translate it into words that we understood. The word that was translated here, great whales, was a word tanin, T-A-N-N-I-N. -N -N. It's, it's a Hebrew word, tanin. It, it actually means, let's see, right here, a marine or land monster. Something of giant size. Now, if you read through there, that is a sea serpent or a jackal. Dragon, sea monster, serpent, whale. Now that's a pretty broad category here, right? Pretty broad definition. You know what jackal is? Jackal's a dog, uh, like a fox, coyote, about this tall. He's got ears bigger than his head. If you've ever seen a picture of him, it looks like a coyote that got his ears stuck in something and they got yanked out really big. They're huge. Then you've got a whale and then you've got a marine or land monster, a dragon, a sea monster. When you begin to understand, now first of all, there are, t there are two words that kind of get mixed up in the Hebrew. Tanin and tanim. One's an N, one's an M. Tanim is the plural form for jackals. When you add an I, we add an S to make things plural, right? People, peoples. No, that doesn't work. Dog, dogs. Cow, cows. They used letters to make things plural as well. Tan, T A N, meant jackal. Tanim, meant jackals. But tanin meant one monster. And taninim meant monsters or dragons. You follow me? When people started translating the Bible, there was some, there was some mix up on whether or not tanin was the plural of jackal or not. And you'll find throughout the Bible in many instances, especially newer translations, they have substituted the word jackal for dragon throughout the scripture. And I have a great I have a whole lot of scriptural references if you want them. We're not going to go there at this point. But that's just to say that there are 27 scriptural appearances of the word tanin. Many times, especially in the King James translated dragons. Taninim, or dragons, 
There's one scriptural appearance. And, and the word tenim for jackals is in there 14 times. Now, let's talk for just a minute. Are dinosaurs in the Bible? The word dinosaur does not occur in the Bible. Neither does the word computer, internet, or Facebook. Microwave, air conditioner, automobile, they're not in the Bible. Why? Huh? The King James Version of the Bible was written in 1611, translated in 1611. All these words were added to our vocabulary, to our language, well after that point. The word dinosaur, or actually dinosauria, was a classification made by Sir Richard Owen in 1842. Very good. And it means terrible lizard. They had found a bunch of bones, big bones. Reptile bones. And up to this point, guess what they called them? Dragons. Why is that hard for us to understand? Why is that hard for us to con conceive? Why do we have a problem with that? You know why? Because we've been shown that dragons are mythical beasts that they show on television. They come in video games, and they come in movies with elves fairies, and knights in shining armor. We've been taught that dragons are just as mythical as unicorns. Do you know that the word unicorn is in the Bible? It is. We say it's an ox. How do we know? But I'm not going to go there. I'm not going to uh, divert here. But what I'm saying is we have been programmed to dismiss dragons and their existence because the Scripture shows dragons living coexistently with man. And we can't have that in evolutionary thought because man and dinosaur are separated by 65 million years of evolutionary process. They cannot have existed together because scientists say so. Yes. Terrible lizard. Yes. All right. So we've got the coining of the word in 1841, 1842 of the word dinosauria as a category or classification. So what happened to the dinosaurs? I'm not going to lie to you. I'm a, I'm a young earth creationist. I believe that God created dinosaurs the same time he made cows. He made dinosaurs, land dinosaurs, the same day he made man. And Adam named them. Now we look at that and we go, how, how is this possible the dinosaurs would eat him? Before Genesis chapter 9, everything was a herbivore. All things were given plants to eat. <gasps> That's impossible. Tyrannosaur had three-inch long teeth, or six-inch, I think it was six-inch long, between six and nine inches long. Why in the world would he have these long, sharp, pointy teeth if he ate vegetables? Um, has anybody ever stuck their hand in a panda bear's mouth? A panda bear has long, needle-sharp teeth, and all he eats is roots from bamboo stalks. Koala bears, the same thing. They eat eucalyptus, but they have sharp, pointy teeth. You can be a vegetarian, folks, and your teeth are still sharp. There are, net, there are some foods, food sources, that would require sharp teeth. We eat a steak because man failed from our original creation, from our original position. We've got, I've got sharp, pointy teeth right here. Does that mean I was created to eat meat? Or does that mean I adapted to eat meat? 
Come on. See, it, it matters what, where you start from. I can build a case for creation. The evolutionists have built a case for evolution. What I want you to recognize is that while you can say, well, th what you're saying is conjecture and speculation, so is theirs. And mine at least has the promise of eternal life. If I, believe in if I believe in creation and evolution's true, what have I lost? Absolutely nothing. I will just simply grow old, die, and cease to exist. The world will continue to move toward its ultimate in, uh, cold death of the universe and possible re-implosion. What have I lost? Not a thing. But if I believe in evolution and God created everything and says that everything belongs to Him and He is in control of everything, I believe in evolution and I discount and reject Christ, what have I lost? I've lost everything. See, you can say, if nothing else, you're playing it safe. But folks, I believe there's more to it than that. I've heard people say, well, what happened to the dinosaurs? Some people say that the dinosaurs were wiped out by a meteor that struck somewhere in the Yucatan Peninsula threw up enough dust into the atmosphere, caused a cold climate, and a, uh, what we call now, now, nowadays Al Gore's on this bandwagon and so many others, climate change. And the plant life died out that, we were, that they were used to, and the dinosaurs died, ushering in the Ice Age. Some people have a little more creative aspect. They just missed the boat. Ladies and gentlemen, dinosaurs were on the ark. I believe it. Why? Why do I believe it? Well, because actually after the time of Noah's flood, there, is a, there are some references that we're going to get into. How could, how could Noah get the dinosaurs on the ark? Zach. Exactly. Very good. Reptiles never stop growing. Through their entire life, reptiles will grow. You see a snake this long, you let him live another year, he's going to be this long. Another year, he's going to be this long. That's how these, these reptiles get to monstrous proportions. They live a long time. Okay? Now, first of all, let's consider the size of the ark. The ark was 450 feet long by an 18-inch cubit. It was 75 feet wide and 45 feet high with three decks. Now, we're not talking about a little bitty boat. We're not talking about this. Please, this is not... <coughs> the ark was massive. For many years, for centuries, it was the largest ocean-going vessel ever. It was not designed to sail. It was simply designed to float. Noah wasn't going anywhere. He was just going on top of the water. That's all he wanted. And he was preserving the animals. Why did he take two of each kind? So they could breed after the water went back down, right? Right? Now, older, species, uh, older reptiles have less of their life left, and they're not as viable in breeding. Anybody raise animals? Raise animals? You raise chickens? I got chickens. After so many years, the chickens quit laying eggs. After a while, they quit producing, and so they got to be put in the freezer. <laughs> Cook them rascals. But what we find is that a younger dinosaur would have a longer reproductive life after the flood. 
Second point was like uh, Zach made, they'd have been smaller, they'd have taken up less space. Younger will sleep more, eat less, take up less room, and will have longer reproductive lifespans. The average size of a dinosaur is a buffalo, about the size of an American bison. Why do they say that? Well, most of the, they've not found any that were medium size. They were either really small or really big. And so the median or the mean size was about the size of a buffalo. All right. So after the flood, there was a change in the environment. The Bible says that the fountains of the great deep burst forth. There would not be the amount of vegetation left, right? Vegetation would have to grow back. Also, right directly after the flood, God told, the, told Noah that he was placing on, on the animals the dread or the fear of humanity. And that humans could now begin to eat meat. In other words, there was now a rift between man and, and beast. Now people go, what? We, I don't understand that. Of course you don't, because you're born in this time period where we don't go out and hug up to a, to a mountain lion and say, nice kitty. You don't... The idea of a fin popping up out of the water in the, in the ocean terrifies us. Thank you, Steven Spielberg. The idea of the, some of these things, but that's based on our experience. Prior to the flood, animals and men coexisted without problem. Is that hard for anybody else to comprehend besides me? It is difficult, but the Bible brings it forth. And who is the authority, me or the Scripture? See, if you're expecting me to give you perfect sound evidence that there has got to be these dinosaurs who are living with man, all I can point you to is this. I'm not an authority. I stand on, I read people's uh, papers. I've listened to hours of lectures. I've done research. I've looked in di dictionaries. I've come up with all kinds of ideas that somebody else has written down. But this is an authority. Why? Because he was there. After the uh, flood, yay, that's cheesy. <laughs> uh, dinosaurs would have been hunted for food. You could get a lot of steaks out of that. You could put hamburger in the in the freezer for a for several years. Uh, probably everything tastes like chicken. If you fought, hey, evolutionists said they evolved into birds, so why not? They must have tasted just like or turkeys or something. They would they were hunted for medicine. Did you know that there are actually recipes for medical purposes that required parts from dragons? People have all attributed this to mythology. But what if their idea, why do we attribute it to mythology? Because we've got dragons who talk, and they gather gold, right? And they wear rings, and they cast spells, because the evolutionist has made us to believe, and Hollywood has made us to believe that dragons were mythical. Has anybody here seen a dodo? A dodo. A bird. I'm not talking about your, uh, your co-worker, or your classmate, or your sister. I'm talking about a bird. Do you know that there was a dodo bird? It's extinct. Just because we haven't seen it doesn't mean it didn't live. Passenger pigeons are extinct. I was looking through several things. The saber-toothed cat. It existed. I never saw one, thankfully. I'm not a big cat person anyway. I'm definitely not a big, big cat person. 
The Tasmanian tiger, there's evidence for a Tasmanian tiger. It no longer exists. Why? They were hunted to extinction. Here's something that Dr. Billy Graham said. A young boy wrote to him and asked Billy Graham, and he said, I am eight years old, and I have a question for you. Did Noah's Ark have dinosaurs in it, or did they die in the flood? My parents didn't know the answer, and they said to ask you. And he writes back to this young boy and says, Noah lived many thousands of years ago, and the Bible doesn't give a detailed list of what animals and birds were included on the ark. The Bible does say, however, that the reason God preserved the animals and the birds on the ark was to keep their various kinds alive throughout the earth. Accurate. After the flood was gone. Since dinosaurs apparently were extinct a long time before Noah, who said? Who said? The scientists, right? They were extinct long before uh, Noah and also didn't appear after the flood. It seems unlikely that his ark included such creatures. But then he goes into Noah's story is more than just an interesting story, and I hope you will read it. When you read it, I hope you will carefully study what kind of person Noah was. Yeah, he was a drunk. After the flood, he planted an, a vineyard and got drunk from the fruit. He found grace in the eyes of the Lord. Not because he was perfect, but because God looked at him and loved him. The Bible says he lived in a terrible world, a world that had forgotten God and made fun of him, but the Bible says he was a righteous man, blameless among the people, and he walked with God. I pray that this will be your goal as you grow older, and he wants you to love him in return. And ask Jesus to come into your life. Don't worry that the dinosaurs were extinct and the scientists say that the dinosaurs lived 65 million years before you did. Just believe in Jesus. Well, what about when the Bible says that all sin came into the world because Adam fell? And that was only a few thousand years ago by tracing our genealogies back. Oh, well, that doesn't matter. Just trust Jesus. Jesus is going to come into your heart. Well, come into my heart and save me from what? From sin and death. Well, death was here before Adam. So why is God going? After all, maybe there is no God because evolutionary processes and random mutations and random chance through millions of years of natural selection and natural processes has created everything that we see. Why do I need Jesus? Everything is an accident. So you want me to draw one piece of order? out of millions and millions and billions of years of chance. One piece of order. And that's Jesus. Folks, it matters. It does matter. Dinosaurs would have been hunted for fear. You've got an animal that can grow to three stories tall and is now carnivorous. He attacks households and eats people. Because now people are... <clears throat> You are now in the food chain. So you would attack them just like people in India will go out in raiding parties and hunt down tigers. Why? Because tigers come into the villages and eat children. People say, no, not... Folks, do you realize how sheltered we are here in America? Do you realize how nice it is to be able to go in and shut a door? And not have to go... I can send my kids out to play and not worry about some wild animal coming and dragging them into the woods and eating them. And the minute we find something in our, in our nice, tidy communities that shouldn't be there, that's carnivorous, we kill it. But in other countries, they deal with this. Tigers still raid villages where people live in hovels. And they eat people. And the, the last one is valor. You see it all the time. I shot so-and-so and he was this big. He had a rack on him like this. And the next person has got to have a little bit bigger rack, right? Yep. You should have seen that bear I shot. And his foot was that big. Well, mine foot was that big. I seen one that if he had stepped on yours, he would have been a pizza. <clears throat> Back years ago, ain't much different from today. You get you bag the biggest dino and you come dragging it back into camp and say, Hey ladies, look at me. Yep, yeah, yeah, look at that little thing that he brought in. 
Yeah. I brought in the big one. All right. Here's the big dinosaur. I'm the man. Okay. It's not much different. People do the same things today. So bragging rights, valor. Now, I want to get into this. Dinosaurs described in the book of Job. And I'm not going to keep you much longer. If you'll turn in your Bibles to Job chapter 40, because I'm going to read... Oh, man, I thought he was talking about dinosaurs. Didn't think we had to read the Bible. We're going to read the Bible here. Chapter 40, beginning with verse 15. The Bible says, Now behold, Behemoth, which I made with thee, the word behemoth is, everybody say behemoth. You just spoke Hebrew. Because he, the word behemoth is a transliteration. They didn't know what to call it. They didn't know what to change the name and translate the name into. So they just took the Hebrew word and carried it over into the English and introduced the word behemoth into our language. Really what the word behemoth means the closest we can come to, is beast. What is this? What is this? It's called the what? The Bible. Do you know what the word Bible actually means? It simply means book. When we call it, this is the book. What we're saying is this is the book of books. This is the book. Just by saying this is this is the book there's hundreds there's thousands there's millions of books but this is the book there's thousands of beasts but what god is saying in his word here is this is the beast this is the beast of beasts this is the chief beast and it says here i made him with you He eateth grass as an ox. Lo now, his strength is in his loins, and his force is in the navel of his belly. He moveth his tail like a cedar. The sinews of his stones are wrapped together. His bones are as strong pieces of brass. His bones are like bars of iron. He is the chief of the ways of God. He that made him can make his sword to, to approach unto him. Surely the mountains bring him forth food, where all the beasts of the field play. So here we got beasts of the field. They're, they're beneath Him. Because He is the chief of the ways of God. He is the thing that God made. He lieth under the shady trees in the covert of the reeds and fins. Does anybody know what the fins are? The fins is an ancient, uh, basically an England, uh, Brit, like a Britain word, that means swamps, marshes. So He lives in the swamps. The shady trees cover him with their shadow. The willows of the brook compass him about. Behold, he drinketh up a river and hasteth not. He trusteth that he can draw up Jordan into his mouth. He taketh it with his eyes. His nose pierceth through snares. All right. So now we've got Behemoth. He is the beast of beasts. This is what your King James in the notes will say that the behemoth is. Do you know why it says that this is what behemoth is? Because these are the biggest land animals that we know about. There's no doubt by anybody, any kind of uh, research or any kind of uh, person who is looking into the Bible that, that what, what's being talked about in uh, Job chapter 40 is big. He says his bones are like bars of iron. This is a big rascal, okay? This is the big one. This is the great, big, huge. It's, everything about it just sounds big. His strength is in his belly. That's his, uh, he's, got a, he's got a large belly. He's got big iron-like bones. He is the biggest thing that God has made on the earth. He doesn't have a problem thinking he could drink the entire River Jordan. Now, does this sound big? 
So we look at it and we say, okay, well, it must be something big, so what do we got that's big? I've got to make it big. Nah, it won't work. So we go into, okay, we got, a, we got a elephant or a hippopotamus. The problem is the descriptions don't fit. Why? Cedar tree. I've got cedar trees with limbs bigger than that. That's a piece of rope that somebody stuck back there. This one's even better. That's not a cedar either. When the Bible begins to talk about the cedar, the word cedar throughout Scripture is always in reference to the cedars of Lebanon. These were the biggest trees in the, in the uh, Middle Eastern area. They were used for everything that was big in construction. The, they were used in the palace of the kings. They were used in the building of the temple, the first temple, Solomon's temple. They were used in about everything. They were imported because they were so huge. They were so big. They were so beautiful. They made such great wood uh, for construction that they were actually imported. The cedars of Lebanon were enormous. When it says that he, he moveth his tail like a cedar, this is not what you get a picture of. So here we have an elephant and a hippopotamus with cedar tree tails. Or maybe something like that. Yeah, if you ever seen a giraffe, he looks, I, I mean, I've got, I've got little pieces of rope that are bigger than a giraffe's tail. Here's a, here's a description of a brachiosaur. A brachiosaur, his front legs were 20 feet tall. His front legs were 20 feet. In other words, we could not put his front legs in this building. Just one of his bones was over six feet tall in his leg. The apatosaur had 82 bones in his tail. What was that for? Because he weighed so much that to move his leg, that the musculature to move one leg had to pull and balance off of a tail that was long enough to keep him from toppling over on his own weight because three legs could not support him. The Diplodocus, the tail was 46 feet long. That's amazing. And they found these dinosaurs fossilized. The Diplodocus, the largest sauropod dinosaur, stood with its head erect, 60 feet from the ground. They weighed 100 tons, which was approximately 14 school buses in weight. And measured from tip of the head to the tip of the tail at 130 feet long. About three of them cover a football field. The Diplodocus was so strong, his legs were so massive, and the muscles were so strong that you could stack two more on top of him, and his legs could hold him up at 100 tons. That is strong. And when God begins to talk about the chief of things I've made, why would we ever think that, an, that a... Uh, here we got one that's 115 foot compared to a six foot man. Here's one compared to a car. I heard somebody say that if, they, if one of them stepped on you, they would surely impress you. <laughs> ha. Leviathan. Leviathan. Job chapter 41. Can still draw out Leviathan with an hook? or his tongue with a cord which thou let us down? None is so fierce that dare stir him up. Who then is able to stand before me? In other words, 
you're afraid of this rascal. If you're afraid of him, and I made him, how can you stand before me? What is Job ta what is, what's happening here? Job is talking to God, and God is answering him out of a whirlwind. The Bible says up through this point, up to uh, this point, Job and his friends have been bantering back and forth about why Job fell into such bad fortune. And they've come up with all kinds of solutions, all kinds of problems that Job was uh, guilty of, sins that he ha shouldn't have done. And finally, Job throws up his hands and says, Why me, God? Be careful when you ask that question, because God might just answer you. Because he answered Job. And jo he asked Job over 87 rhetorical questions, questions to which Job would not answer. But jo uh, God said, Stand up like a man. And you answer me when I ask you a question. And the Bible says that God pelted him with question after question. Where were you when I laid the foundations of the earth? Where were you when I stretched the line up on it? Where were you when I made the waters and the dry land? Where were you when I stretched out the stars in the heavens? Where were you when I did all these things? Do you know where all these things come from? Where does the rain come from? Where does the snow come from, Job? Come on, tell me. Can you tell me where the wind comes from? Can you tell me all these things? Now, can you tell me about Behemoth? Have you ever seen anything like him? Look at him, Job. Can you imagine, Job? Here he is, he's lost everything, and God talking to him out of a whirlwind and asking him and says, Look at this, Job. He was not talking to Job about some mythical thing that Job hadn't seen. Why do Christians have a problem with this? We, can, we have no problem with God talking to Job out of a whirlwind, but we have a problem with a dinosaur? What's wrong with us? We've been manipulated and deceived by science. God says, look at him, Job. Have you ever said that to your kids? Look at him. Look at it. I'm expecting you to look. And Job looks at him. And he says, now, this is the biggest thing that I've made. And you're dwarfed in his size. And he says, but you can't get to him. But I can, because I created him. Then he says, look at Leviathan. You're scared of him. And I created him. But you come to me so flippantly and say, why me, God? You're scared of the animals. Folks, how many of you would like to volunteer to go into a cage with a lion? How about a grizzly bear? Hmm? Come on. You want to go into the cage with a grizzly bear. He's hungry. He has not had anything to eat, and you look like supper. How many people want to dive in to a pool of sharks with dead fish strapped all over your body? Sign me up. No, we're afraid of the animals, right? And God says, but you're, not, you're afraid of them, but you're not afraid of me, and I made them. He says, look at this. No, there's none that fierce. Who can discover the face of his garment? Or who can come to him with his double bridle? Who can open the doors of his face? What does that mean? You're going to open his mouth? You open his mouth, Job. Go ahead, I dare you. Open his mouth. It says here, his teeth are terrible roundabout. We just saw a tooth that was passed around here that was from a, an animal that had an entire mouthful of them suckers. But this may not be what uh, God was describing. This is even worse. He says, His scales are His pride. Shut up together as with a closed seal. One is so near to another that no air can come between them. Do you know there's not another description of an animal in the Bible as vivid as this description? He's telling us how close his scales are together. It says here, no air can come between them. They're joined one to another. They stick together and they cannot be sundered, which means broken apart. By his niesings, niesings is a word that actually means like sneezing or coughing. By his niesing, a light doth shine, and his eyes are like the eyelids of the morning. In other words, his eyes kind of glow. Anybody ever seen the light reflect off of something's eyes? It, get, it makes it's kind of eerie, isn't it? Yeah. A cat. Out of his mouth go burning lamps, and sparks of fire leap out. 
Out of his nostrils goeth smoke as out of a seething pot or cauldron. His breath kindleth coals, and a flame goeth out of his mouth. People go, that's it. That's it. This is mythical. No such thing as anything that breathes fire. Did you know that there is a bug that can mix hydrogen peroxide and another chemical together and shoot out a jet, an aerosol jet, at 212 degrees? That's hot enough to boil water. It's called a bombardier beetle. Go look it up. It will actually so scald a frog that is trying to eat it for lunch that it decides to go somewhere else and look for supper, okay? Maybe it decides to fast that day. Because this bombardier beetle can actually mix together these compounds. We've got animals that secrete such deadly venom. A spitting cobra actually can release its venom from its fangs after drawing in lung full of breath and blow out and produce an aerosol effect that will blind you with its venom. Do you know that methane, which is something that everybody produces, is flammable? Methane will burn. And every human being, every organic creature that eats and has a digestive system produces methane. Would it be so hard for us to come to an idea or an understanding that if God wanted something to breathe fire, it'll breathe fire? We've got a bug that can throw out jet of hot chemicals. If something wants to breathe, if God wants it to breathe fire, it can. Okay. I'm wanting to finish up here. Flakes of his flesh are joined together. They are firm in themselves. They cannot be moved. His heart is as firm as a stone. Yea, his heart is a piece of uh, nether millstone. When he raiseth up himself, the mighty are afraid. By reason of breakings, they purify themselves. What does that mean? Leave that one to your imagination. The sword of him that layeth at him cannot hold the spear, the dart, nor the har harbogen. He esteemeth iron as straw, and brass as rotten wood. The arrows cannot make him flee. Sling stones are turned with him into stubble. Darts are counted as stubble. He laugheth at the shaking of a spear. Sharp stones are under him. He spreadeth sharp points, pointed things upon the mire. He maketh the deep to boil like a pot. He maketh the sea like a, a pot of ointment. He maketh a path to shine after him. What is that? That's a wake in the water. Has anybody ever watched a whale breach? Have you ever seen a whale breach like on TV? They come up out of the water. What does the water look like? It explodes. Have you ever seen it? And when he hits again, boom, the water just goes everywhere. What you're describing here is that when he comes up out of the water, it's just like this massive, uh, this major event. Upon the earth there is none his like who is made without fear. He beholdeth all high things. He is a king over all the children of pride. He is, he's not afraid of anything. What do they say that these things could be? An ichthyosaur, a plesiosaur, or a psychocircus. What is that? It's a giant crocodile. This is an actual skull of a psychocircus. This is a regular skull of a crocodile. Crocodiles are bigger than our alligators, and this is what they found. There were actually beasts that big. You see this right here? The, the part, this point of his nose? It's actually hollow, and they don't know what he did with it. There is a possibility that it could have been a possible mixing chamber for something that could have caused fire. And it doesn't necessarily mean it's fire like we see in, from Hollywood but something similar, just because we haven't produced it at uh, MGM, just because Disney hasn't come up with it yet, doesn't mean that it doesn't, doesn't exist. So, did dinosaurs exist? Coexist with man? The Ica stones from Peru actually show these were, these were created in Peru. These were found in Peru, over 500 of them. Show something eating this guy. Look at that. 
If you look in the uh, dinosaur books, you'll find plated dinosaurs like this called stegosaurs. If you look this and this is very similar to what is known as a triceratopsian. In other words, they had three horn, two horns on their forehead, one out of their nose. Stegosaurs usually had pointed spines on their tails. Here shows people fighting these suckers. See, this guy's trying to kill this one, and this one's being eaten by this one, and this guy's being eaten by one behind him. They're fighting a group, a pack of dinosaurs. Is that, is that uh, evidence? I don't know. In Mexico, they found a whole, a whole bunch of these clay figurines, all in the shape of dragons and dinosaurs. National bridges. Natural Bridges uh, Monument in Utah, the Anasazi Indians carved cave, what they call pictoglyphs. Most of them are of horses, of buffalo, of fights between tribes, and they found this. On, what does that look like? Well, that's nothing, that's a blotch in the rock. Do you know that most evolutionists, that's what they'll tell you, that's a stain on the rocks? Now, all the rest of them can be man-made. But this can't be man-made. Why? Because it doesn't fit with their theology, with their theory. I want to finish right here. Dinos today. And the Likula... Swamp in the Congo, which is a 55,000 square mile swamp. 55,000 square miles, bigger than the entire state of Indiana. It's only been 80% explored. Uh, it's only been 20% explored. It's 80% unexplored. The natives of that area, most of them have never seen a white man. Talk of a beast, a creature in the swamp called Mokili Mbembe. Mokili Mbembe means one that stops the river. They talk of a, of a ferocious territorial beast that lives in the water, actually nests along the sides, and eats leaves off the trees off the bank. Now they say that it's not as big as the ones that we've discussed. Why? We, we talked about how they grow the entire lifespan. If something lived 900 years like many of the, the people in the Bible, a reptile that lived 900 years could get immense, enormous. If it doesn't live, but say it lives 50 years, it's not going to get near as large, is it? Or 100 years, it's not going to get near as large. But we got, they, they talk about these things that they've uh, had people uh, knocked out of their canoes by them. The Aborigines in Australia talk of the bunyip. We've got, what is this? A Loch Ness Monster. Do you know that these have all been relegated to the idea that they are all mythology? Why? Do I believe that Nessie's out there? I don't know. I'm not one of these Bigfoot hunters, okay? I don't go chasing after this. I, I don't care. But if they find it, it's not going to hurt me. If they find a dinosaur alive in the Congo in Africa, there's going to be evolutionists scrambling from everywhere trying to figure out what went wrong with 65 million years of evolution. Because if it's still here, then it didn't get the memo to evolve. Oh no! We've got a living dinosaur. What are we going to do? Do you know that they actually found a tree, the wall of my pine. They believed it was extinct. They found it growing in Australia. They just hadn't discovered it yet. The coelacanth is a, is a fish that they believed was extinct at the time of the dinosaurs. They found them. You know who was, how they found them? 
Guys were fishing in Indonesia and they were selling them on the market. They've been, they've been extinct for millions and millions of years and the scientists walking through the market looking at the fish goes, ah! That ain't supposed to be here. What they believed was that its lobed fins had developed into legs and it had evolved into a land dwelling. It hadn't. They're in, they're in aquariums today. Okopogo, British Columbia, Canada. Lake Champlain, New York has Champ. Loch Ness in Scotland has Nessie. There's so many different people who have claimed to have seen dinosaurs. And they get, put, they get laughed at. They get put in the National Enquirer. They get, to, they get put on, um, what was it, Monster Quest on Discovery Channel. And people look at them and they laugh a little bit. Poor fella, he thinks he's all a dinosaur. But what's to say that there's not something out there that God, God created? Is this definitive evidence? No. Was it intended to be? Nope. I believe it. The Bible teaches it. If you follow evolutionary thought, then you have chosen to believe it. End of discussion. So what do we do with this? Is this going to matter to your salvation? Nope. You trusted Jesus with your heart and your life? That's all it takes to be saved. If I'm wrong, I'm sure the Lord will clear it all up later. But I believe that the evidence points to it. And I will say this. I've chosen to take the Bible literally. I will not stand before God one day and tell Him you didn't know what you were talking about. I may tell Him I didn't know what you were talking about. I may have to say, God, I'm sorry I did not understand. I saw like Paul did through a glass darkly. One day I'll see face to face. But the Bible teaches it and I have chosen to believe it just as it was written. Does anybody have any questions before we dismiss? Oh yeah, <laughs> I brought it up here, and I meant to. Sister Lisa had brought this, and I thought it was a good picture. Fred and Dino, proof, proof that man and dinosaurs existed together. Thank you, Sister. I've forgotten. I'd have, I would have felt bad afterwards. Yes. Mm -hmm. Do you think that it could ever happen, like, for the mosquito with the DNA that he got off the animal and it, it was thrown in the south and they found it? You know what I'm saying? Like the DNA was in the south. I understand what you're saying. The... What they, what they, what they proved, what they said was that they pulled the DNA, but they only had pieces of the DNA. And so they injected different parts of DNA into it. First of all, our, I don't believe that our, gen, uh, our genetic sequencing is anywhere close uh, to getting that accurate. Gen genetics is immense. But I will say this, I believe that you'd be uh, appalled at what our governments and governments around the world have done with genetic mutations. We know that they have uh, created Dolly the sheep a completely cloned sheep using just DNA and test tubes. They created that. I would say that we would be, our mind would be completely blown away if we found out what they have done in the name of science. I've seen that, yes. They've injected uh, human stem cells into uh, organisms just to see what they could get. Any other questions?
the sky, the stars, mm -hmm. just go outside and look around. This is what God made. And he made order. And what scientists have made are an abomination. They're disgusting, disfigured, most of the time have a very short lifespan. Anything else? Apparently I've soundly confused everyone, so uh, my job here is done. <laughs> if there's no others, let's dismiss with prayer. Heavenly Father God, we thank you for your word, and we thank you for the uh, folks who have come out this evening. God, I pray that every word has been touched by your spirit. I pray, God, that 